Right, shalom, everybody. Lord, the most high in Christ bless you all. Good to see everybody on another Sabbath day. I wanted to go over a class today that some people might think is an interesting class. <laughs> um, we're going over a topic devoted to patience and patience, especially when it comes to delaying gratification and the things that we, we want in our life. So I'm going to start the class with a video clip and then we're going to explain what the topic is today because the thing is, is that when you look at Esau's social sciences or the social sciences that exist in this world, a lot of people think that they've discovered something and they're bringing this new wisdom to the earth when the fact is that the Most High in Christ in the Bible has already given us this wisdom ages ago that are just being rediscovered now. So while they like to pat up themselves on the back and talk about the things they've discovered, we're gonna go over some scriptures to show that the things that they've so-called discovered are things that the Most High and Christ have already taught us in the scriptures. And then we're gonna narrow it down to one particular topic, which um, we'll speak about afterwards. So Kadar, you can play the video. And then after the video, we're only gonna to listen to about two minutes of it. Um, I gave you the time, two minutes, I think, a few seconds, 2.13, whatever. And then afterwards, we're going to talk about um, what today's topic is going to be. What is this marshmallow test? Well, when you look at children and you look at all the different theories about what makes successful kids, you realize that almost all the theories are wrong because they haven't been verified. Like, for example, high IQ. You have a lot of high IQ people who become marginal members of society. And so what is the one psychological test that correlates with success in life? And I found out that it's the marshmallow test. You get kids and ask them, do you want a marshmallow now or two marshmallows a few hours from now? And the kids that want the marshmallow now tend to be those that want shortcuts, those that don't want to do the hard work. They want the, the, the quick kill. They grab that marshmallow. But the other ones say, no, wait a minute. If I wait two hours, I can get two marshmallows. I can hold out. There's a pot of gold waiting for me. They're not going to take the shortcut. And so you say to yourself, well, that's a test for kids. But then you track them decade by decade by decade. And you find that they are more successful. They have a lower divorce rate, higher income, higher status in society that don't want that simple payoff now, but are going to delay gratification into the future. And so I realized that that's the key to success in life, not just science, but in life. Don't take the shortcuts, but can it be taught? Well, part of it is um, your personality that is formed when you're very young. Okay, Let, let's be very clear about that. But I think that, yes, I think that, um, for example, it turns out that if you do the same thing with poor children and the same thing with middle class children, it turns out that poor children will, in general, go for the, for the quick kill because they know that things disappear real fast. Uh, if there's money in the house, it's gone in the future. If you can show people that there is a pot of gold out there, that yes, you hold out, you go to college, you learn the discipline, there's a pot of gold out there. You can learn to appreciate that fact. What we have in the brain that is different from animals is we understand time. We understand the future. My grandparents came to California a hundred years ago. So... The main thing that, because I've seen that video years ago, but I always wanted to do a class on it. Because the main thing that he's going through is already spoken about in the scriptures. When you look at what Christ was explaining in Matthew 16 and 24, in Matthew 16 and 24, Christ is speaking to the disciples and he tells them the very simple fact of the kingdom of heaven. He says, if any man will come unto me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And so everything that this gospel revolves around at some point is going to come back to denying self in order to follow Christ. So even though they're using the terms of, well, they're delaying gratification so that they can receive this proverbial pot of gold at the end of the tunnel. Our pot of gold at the end of the tunnel has always been the kingdom of heaven. But in order to obtain that kingdom of heaven, what do we have to do? We have to delay the gratification now 
of going into all of our different lusts, of all the different things that we think we want in order to fulfill the things that Christ is telling us to do. It's the same thing, and I'm just gonna go through some trips really fast about it. It's the same thing that you read like in Galatians 6 and 9, where the scriptures tell us not to be weary and well-doing. Galatians 6 and, 6 and 9, and let us not be weary and well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So what is that going into? The same concept. We're not talking about something that was written a week ago or a year ago or last year. We're talking about wisdom that's thousands of years old. So they can call it what they want and say, oh, we found a marshmallow test where people that delay gratification become more successful in life, have more successful marriages and things like that. But what did the scriptures tell us long ago? The scriptures told us that we can't be, we can't grow weary in doing the right thing. Because we're, when we apply the scriptures, we apply the commandments and we apply that discipline, we're doing the right thing. But we can't grow weary in that because the scripture says in due season, we're gonna reap if we faint not. So everything in the scriptures is pointing to a point in time, in the future, and even when you read Hebrews the 11th chapter, when it speaks about the forefathers of faith, it talks about how our forefathers understood that the promises that the Most High gave in the covenant were things they were never going to see in their lifetime. It was things far off. But the scriptures tell you even about Abraham, how he saw the promises, embraced them, believed them, and he had hope in them. And so when you look at that patience, even when you read the book of Galatians 5, patience is what? It's a fruit of the Spirit. And the last one is Romans 8 and 25. In Romans 8 and 25, it says, but if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. So that's what it's always been about. It's always been the quote unquote marshmallow test. But thousands upon thousands of years ago, the Most High gave us the truth about what the delayed gratification looks like and about that understanding that denying yourself now can lead you to the reward in the future. So <clears throat> even though that's the overarching theme of what we're dealing with in today's class, and it could be focused primarily with the kingdom of heaven and the things that come um, as associated with that, I want to narrow it down to something much smaller, a much smaller topic, but a very important topic, which is marriage. Because when you look at the same concept in relationships, oh, you got that smile on your face. When you look at the same concept in relationships, and just as far as observing over the course of the last 25 years with all the brothers and sisters that we know and all the ones that we have known, the ones that at one point in time were in the church and the ones that are still in the church, the ones that were in different incarnations of the church and all those things over the years, we see the same trend over and over again when it comes to that concept of the marshmallow test and delayed gratification for success. Brothers and sisters that rush into marriage suffer. That's just what it is. And the ones who wait, for the most part, their marriages look very different. We're not saying perfect, because according to the scriptures, there will always be trouble in the flesh. But it looks very different. So one thing that they brought out, this gentleman in the video, he talks about how the ones who don't have that same level of success are the ones who take shortcuts and are not willing to put in the work. So in the scriptures, what does the shortcut to marriage look like in the scriptures? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's go to Exodus chapter 22. <clears throat> because many of you know the scripture by heart, and this is the shortcut scripture that many people have been using throughout the decades. Exodus 22, and we're going to read verses 16 and 17. And you can now read that for us to go. Exodus chapter 22, verse 16. 
And if a man entice a maid that is not betrothed and lie with her, he shall surely endow her to be his wife. If her father utterly refuse to give her unto him, he shall pay money according to the dowry of virgins. So that's the shortcut of scripture because when you look at how the scriptures outline marriage, even during the time of Moses' ancient days, it was a union of families. There were covenants made. There were contracts made. There were tokens of virginity, all type of things that were done as far as ceremony, ceremonial laws pertaining to the steps that went before the actual marriage and the preparing of the, the wedding chamber and all those things. But people understood, like, wait a minute. Here's this woman I want to deal with. I might be able to bypass all that bureaucracy and red tape and still get what I want. So read that verse again. Verse 16 again. Exodus 22, verse 16. And if a man entice a maid that is not betrothed and lie with her. So stop right there. So it says, if a man entice a maid, so she's not married, she's not promised and engaged to be married. And what does this man try to do, Kadar? Well, he um, he has what the world is called gain. And he steps up to this woman and in his tongue is speech that's going to pull her in to get her to like him. Whether it's telling jokes, whether it's making her laugh, whether it's complimenting her, he's gonna appeal to her lust in some kind of way to get this woman to, to like get into him and like him with the intention of laying down and having sex with her. And so he entices her and then he lays with her. The scripture says he shall surely endow her to be his wife. And so people see that scripture and say, or saw that scripture in the past and was like, okay, what did we? What were we taught? When we came in the face. Sex is marriage. This is the marriage scripture. You want this to is the, this, <laughs> this is the marriage scripture. <laughs> so, it you know, and you said game, and I'm glad you said that because the marriage scripture was he got game. You can if you got a good enough game, you can get married. Didn't matter. Didn't matter what type of brother you were, what type of sister you were, where your understanding was in Christ what your financial situation was or anything like that. Everything was based on he got game so he could get what he wanted. And so that's really what the scriptures found, made it, they, what people thought it made the scriptures to bring into. But read verse 17. If her father utterly refused to give her unto him, he shall pay money according to the dowry of virgins. So we should have recognized right then and there in verse 17 that something's very wrong. Because if this was a real marriage, then why would people be opposed and why would people refuse? Why would her father refuse? So it's letting you know that the way this whole setup was went down was off from the beginning and should never have happened. And it's going to explain it even further in the other shortcut scripture, Deuteronomy 22. Well, but before we leave Exodus, Akira, bring it down. Just one small point I just want to make. Everything in this chapter is a sin. Yes. <laughs> and so everything in this chapter is going into sin, but then they pick two verses to say this was a righteous way of getting married and it is not it absolutely is not the entire chapter is showing you things that we ought not to do so it's the opposite of what we're supposed to be doing when you read this scripture absolutely and i'm glad you brought that point out so the brothers and sisters when you have time read the whole exodus 22 and when you see that verse in this context you'll understand that the most i was quite upset with this as well so, and the same thing could be said of Deuteronomy 22. So when we get to Deuteronomy 22 and 28, it goes into the same scriptures, giving a little bit more insight as far as how this thing went down. All right, so we're now going to the book of Deuteronomy chapter... 22 and 28. Deuteronomy 22 and 28. We're going to read 28 and 29 together. All right. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 28. 
if a man find a damsel that is a virgin, which is not betrothed, and lay hold on her, and lie with her, and they be found, then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father 50 shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife, because he hath humbled her, he may not put her away all his days. So when you look at that, now it's going to says, it says fairly similar to the same thing we read in Exodus. He finds this woman, she's damned, she's not betrothed, she's not promised or engaged to anybody. They take hold of her, they lie together. But this says something interesting, and if they be found. So it's already letting you know this is something covert, it's undercover, it's done in the dark. But it was found out, and after it was found out, now here comes the punishments. Punishments, you gotta pay the shekels of silver to the father. And then the other punishment, which is a really interesting one, he may not put her away all his days. And why is that so powerful? Because what was what was what what was still in effect during the times of the Old Testament? Oh, the 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 the, what, the shoe? No, the bill of divorce. Okay. Remember, I know you're talking about the man with one, the one, one missing shoe. Yeah. One, one loose shoe, that's funny. But back in those days, there was still the bill of divorce. Right. And people were abusing the bill of divorce. Well, the bill of divorce was abuse anyway. Um, it's gonna, we're going to get into that later when we get into the book of Matthew. But the whole point is that when you look at the bill of divorce, it basically stated that if this woman is going not as the husband would have her go, that he could cut her off from his flesh and put her away. And he could get, he could marry another and she could actually marry another. She just couldn't come back to her original husband. And so when you look at that, the bill of divorce had no power over this. Cause it basically is like, yo, you messed up so bad that not only are you gonna pay the money, but you, have, you can't use a bill of divorce to get out of this. You gotta stick with her for the rest of your life. So it was letting you know that everything about this whole process was off. So as time went on, the most I blessed us to have a much better understanding of marriage according to Ephesians 5, according to 1 Corinthians 7 and New Benevolence, according to the great mystery, which marriage between man and woman is a union between Christ and the church. And we've had that understanding all praises to the Heavenly Father in Christ. We had that understanding for well over a decade, close to two decades. And I dare say we probably had that understanding since the 12 tribes days, since after 12 tribes days. And going into like, so what year? 2007? So close to like, almost close to 20 years. But even with that understanding being prevalent, and even with those classes being taught, and even with that wisdom being shared and put out, how many times have we seen these two scriptures used to justify marriage, Kadar, in the last 20, 20 years? Enough. And, yeah, enough. More than enough. More than enough. And the thing is, is that even with the understanding of Christ, there are people who have knowingly, willfully, and in some ways maliciously, ran to these scriptures to try to justify their lust and to try to justify a marriage which they knew under normal circumstances or under the circumstances of the scriptures outlined in Ephesians 5 and 1 Corinthians 7 would not have taken place. And the reason why that happens is because you see a, you see many situations where a sister may come into a church and brother will look at her and basically say, listen, if I don't move fast, somebody else is gonna get there. And what they do is they use that exact same tactic that Kadal was going over, the enticement. And from the enticement, leads to the relationship, or I'll just say it, the enticement leads to sex. And the sex they use to justify the marriage, like, well, we dealt with each other. 
And because we dealt with each other, I mean, you can't break us up. You can't nullify the union. And you can't say we're not married now. So you have no choice but to just bless this and move on. I cry. Yes, bro. I think you 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 let off you let left out part of the process. Bring it up. I was like, yeah, well, the first part you said was correct, but then it's like, okay, I can't marry your sister straight away. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna cut her off from everybody else. So what did that do? That means I'm gonna be the only one that's teacher. She's not gonna be allowed to come to class. She might be able to come to a feast date, maybe, until I marry her. That was it. And that used to happen many times in the, in the past, where sisters with brothers would just show up with a wife. And you'd be like, huh? Yeah, that's my wife. And the sister's looking around in the class like, where am I and what is this place? <laughs> you know? They show up to the feast like they bring in a pot. <laughs> Oh, here's the macaroni and cheese. And oh, by the way, this is my wife. What? Right, so. Back in California on moving day, you moving the whole sister to another brother's house and don't even know it. Well, see, we got the right people on the line today because everybody knows and everybody has seen, because that's why I said, we're speaking about something that we reserved like over the past 25 years. So it's not talking about this brother or that brother or this person on the line or that person on the line, we're talking about well over two decades worth of cases. And so one of the things that will happen in those situations, and I'll say it as plain as I can, when brothers use that tactic, they might get the wife they want, but they have never gotten the marriage that they want. They might get the wife that they want, they got the woman, but they never, ever get the marriage that they want. And that's the reason why, you know, when we start talking about marriage, when we always instruct um, brothers and sisters, the first step is always the same, counsel. It will always be the same, and that will never be different. And so when you go to the book of Ecclesiasticus 37, and of course, many of you know it by heart, but still, we're gonna go there. Ecclesiasticus 37, and we're gonna start at seven because that's really the scriptures that the process really begins there. It begins with the councils. And we can't stress the importance of that enough. Excuse me. So Ecclesiasticus chapter 37, verse seven. What's that name of press special guys? Most high Christ bless. Ecclesiastes 37 and 7. Every counselor extolleth counsel, but there is some that counseleth for himself. Beware of a counselor and know before what need he hath, but he will counsel for himself, lest he cast a lot upon thee, and say unto thee, Thy way is good, and afterward he stand on the other side to see what shall befall thee. So stop. So the scriptures tell us to beware of a counselor and know what need he has. And that scripture is just as true when it comes to relationships, that especially going towards marriage, which is what we're talking about right now. Because in many cases, that person that's counseling for himself is the brother that's trying to get with you. So for the sisters, just understand that. In many cases, the man who's counseling for himself is the one who's trying to get with you. And what are they doing? They're counseling for themselves and they're casting the lot on you to see what's going to happen to you. And so all of those things play out the way they plan it, the way they plan it to happen. And in the end, it's not done with your best interest at heart. Continue, verse 10. So I, I just want to take a moment and go back and make sure we understand. The man that is counseling for himself is the man that's rolling with Exodus 22:16 of a man entice a man. Mm -hmm. 
you're going into that gaming mode and kicking the game and, and causing this woman trying to get her to be attracted to you when as I know as we go on the point is not a woman being attracted to a man it's about a woman learning Christ and being that woman in Christ first before there's even a thought or discussion about marriage so what's happening with that man counseling for himself and enticing this woman he's trying to get this woman to fall in love with him and that is a major part of that problem with not having the patience and being able to wait but i know we're going to go into that later but i just wanted to really huh, go back to exodus 22 to just drive that point home that that man is out there kicking game at this point absolutely continue so we're going on from verse 9. On verse 10. Consult not with one that suspected thee, and hide thy counsel from such as envy thee. Neither consult with a woman touching her of whom she is jealous, neither with a coward in matters of war, nor with a merchant concerning exchange, nor with a buyer of selling, nor with an envious man of thankfulness, nor with an unmerciful man touching kindness, nor with a slothful for any work, nor with an hireling for a year of finishing work, nor with an idle servant of much business, hearken not unto these in any matter of counsel. So when you look at, we're not gonna go through each of those, but the point is very, very easy to, to understand, is that you can't counsel with somebody who has a vested interest in what the issue is and you can't counsel with somebody that's not qualified to be a counselor so in many of these examples that you see there are people that are totally unqualified to give counsel and then in other cases there are people that have a vested interest and it's what you call in this world a conflict of interest and in many cases, when you look at brothers and sisters dealing in marriage, if their count, if a brother is counseling concerning, counseling of, I gotta mute yourself. This was planned. I'm sorry, you bringing up a point, Kaya? Okay. So, in those cases, when you when you look at it, it's showing that the that if a man is coming at the woman and giving counsel towards marriage, it's a vested interest. It's a conflict of interest because you are putting yourself in a situation where you should, if anything, have to separate yourself and say, listen, I'm not the person that can counsel you concerning this because it's something that I want. That's the righteous way to deal. Because when you're counseling for yourself, you're going against exactly what the scripture is explaining right up above. The person that you're supposed to be counseling with is going to explain a little bit further down. And then you read from 12 all the way to 16. All right. Um, let me share the screen. Ecclesiastes chapter 37, verse 12. But be continually with a godly man whom thou knowest to keep the commandments of, of the Lord, whose mind is according to thy mind, and will sorrow with thee if thou shalt miscarry. And let the counsel of thine own heart stand, for there is no man more faithful unto thee than it. For a man's mind is sometimes one to tell him more than seven watchmen that sit above in an high tower. And above all this, pray to the Most High that he will direct thy way in truth. Let reason go before every enterprise and counsel before every action. And so we all know those scriptures by heart because every, I think I come to a class on counsel every day for a whole year. I mean, and I'm not even exaggerating. Every week for Sabbath class, he told a class on counsel and basically said he's not gonna stop until people start listening. So for a whole year, he taught a class on counsel went over these scriptures every single week about being continually with a godly man whom thou knowest to keep the commandments of the Lord whose mind is according to thy mind sorrow with thee if thou shalt miscarry and hold that scripture in your mind because that scripture is going to come up very soon again as we start looking at who we're supposed to be counseling with and why 
You want to counsel with people that you know are keeping the commandments. You want to counsel with people that you know have your best interests at heart. You want to counsel with people that know that you know that love you and care for you. And they're going to sorrow with you if things go wrong and things don't turn out the way they should turn out. Because you've had cases where brothers have done the right thing as far as marriage is concerned and as far as obtaining wives and things did not turn out the right way. And so in those cases, what do we do? We sorrowed with them because we knew that they did, they went about things the way they were supposed to be done. You understand? And then it goes on and explains about even with the counsel of our own heart standing. So once we got that counsel, once we were edified, and once we make the decision, we stick with our guns. That's why the scripture says, when thou is once done, repent not when you get that good counsel. But 15 is the point. And above all this, pray to the Most High that he will direct thy way in truth. We put our trust in the Most High that he's going to guide us to the right path, that he's not going to lead us astray, and that he's going to bring us and unite us with the people that we're supposed to be with. Let reason go before every enterprise and counsel before every action. It's always going to go back to that counsel. And so, when it says reason before every enterprise and counsel before every action, there are brothers that will ask counsel about buying a new car, but will not seek counsel for getting a wife. So it's really, really a change of mentality that needs to happen when you understand that there are people among us and brothers and sisters, we will seek counsel on the smallest things. Do you think I should wear this? Sisters will be like, well, do you, how does this dress look? Do you think I should wear this? Is this appropriate? Is that a, and won't seek counsel for marriage? So if we're going to seek counsel, it says reason before every enterprise and counsel before every action. And every action means every action. So you got some control, but we're gonna move on. We're moving on. All right, so go to the book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter six. Because in Ecclesiasticus chapter 6, we're going to go into the topic which everybody knows by heart, which is the proving of a friend. Because when you read in the book of, when you read in the Bible, it tells you that um, a friend and companion never meet a miss, but above both as a wife or her husband. And so that just pretty much explains that according to the scriptures, the closest union in the Bible is always going to be a husband and wife and a wife with a husband. That surpasses all friendships, that surpasses all relationships, that surpasses everything. So if we know that that union is the ultimate form of friendship, and that there is no higher, then what does the Heavenly Father in Christ say in the Bible pertaining to um, that proving of a friend? So Ecclesiasticus chapter 6, and start at verse 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verse 5. Hold on a second. Sweet language will multiply friends, and a fair speaking tongue will increase kind greetings. We'll stop right there. Because the scripture says, sweet language will multiply friends, and a fair speaking tongue will increase kind greetings. So that's letting you know that some people have that gift. Some people are gregarious. Some people are naturally easy to talk to. And when you have that spirit on you, it seems that friends will multiply around you because you have a fair speaking tongue, you speak sweet language, and there's nothing wrong with that because the opposite of that is a churlish and rude man that the scripture says that um, if you're like anymore. a person, what's that? You don't want to be around that kind right. of person. We're not supposed to be that way. Right. So we're not saying that this is anything wrong with sweet language multiplying friends and a fair speaking tongue increasing kind greetings because that's the spirit we're supposed to have on us anyway. But it explains verse six, something interesting. Be in peace with many, nevertheless have but one counselor of a thousand. So even though you might have people around you that you get along with, and people around you that, you know, you have a good relationship, you're on friendly terms with them, you know, y'all agree on a lot of things, that does not always qualify them to be your counselor. 
because they may have no knowledge of the things you need counsel with. They might not have the spiritual capacity at that point to be a counselor. Or it may be a situation where it's like, you know what? They just are too close to the situation to be effective counsel. So it says be at peace with many, but nevertheless have one counselor of a thousand. And that one counselor of a thousand is already outlined in the scriptures above. That man that you know, that man or woman that you know, fears the most sign Christ, is faithful, and they have the understanding to be able to help you. Because there'll be a lot of brothers and sisters that are good brothers and sisters. But the reason why they can't be a counselor is because they don't know how. It doesn't mean that they're less than, it doesn't mean that they're diminished, it just means it's not their gift. So, verse seven. Verse seven. If thou wouldest get a friend, prove him first, and be not hasty to credit him. The scripture says, if thou wouldest get a friend, prove them first, and be not hasty to credit him. So when the scripture is talking about proving a friend and not being hasty when it comes to giving them credit for being, because you know, when you little, that's how you make friends. Somebody walking the street, hey, that's a nice bike you got. Wanna ride? Yeah, let's ride. Okay, you're my friend. That's how you make friends when you're young. You don't make friends that way when you're an adult. You shouldn't. You should have more sense than that. The scripture says, don't be hasty. Don't be fast to give people credit and to give somebody that title of a friend. Because the scripture just says, if you want to get a friend, you have to prove them first. And what's the number one factor in proving any friend? What is that number one factor? Time and, and time and- um, what's Time that? and time. Time, I was gonna say time and adversity. So not just time, but time and going through things together to see how that person reacts to those things that confront them in life, whether it's, you know, an argument, whether it's death, whether it's something that they're struggling with spiritually. Over time, you're going to see, because you know how we talk about this all the time. Right. Like, we can give someone commandments and scriptures, and you might give a sister, like say, for example, we're talking about sisters, you give a sister a scripture about not eating swine. Oh, okay, that's right. I'm not going to do it. You give right. a sister a scripture about this. Oh, okay, they're not going to do it. But when it's something that hits on one of their lusts, you see it. brother or sister, that they want to do and they don't want to give up, then you really see what they're about. And you don't know that right away. That's why I say time and adversity. It's like going through things, dealing with them, and seeing how they react, how they change, how they work and how they, you know, basically conform to Christ in the scriptures. Absolutely. And so when you look at that time factor, now it brings us back to the video we played at the beginning. Because, bring it up. Uh, Dylan, on that time, this is Proverbs 17 and 17. A friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for diversity. So it doesn't matter what you're going through, you know, whether you broke, that person's still going to be your friend. Whether you're rich, that person's still going to be your friend. Whether you're homeless, that person's still going to be your friend. So that's kind of like linking what what um the dog was saying. A friend's going to love him at all times. So no matter what you're going through, what yeah, I've got a whole bunch of money, so you're around me because um, I'm rich, or I'm going to be I'm going to be Akira's friend because we all know who his brother is. That's why I'm going to be his friend, you know. So it's not about benefits. It's about your friend's gonna love at all times through all circumstances. Right, all praises. And so when you look at, that's when the scriptures are going into about, don't be hasty to give them credit, prove them first. And like the dogs and Gadawa bringing out about that time and the time and adversity. The reason why that's a powerful thing is because even when you look at the video that we just now went over at the beginning of the class, what was the main fact that he was talking about? The understanding of time. The understanding of time. Are you willing to delay your gratification? Are you willing to delay the things you want until a more opportune time when everything is revealed that needs to be revealed and you know the things that you need to know and have the answer to the questions that need to be answered? And now you can say with confidence 
this brother or this sister is my friend. You understand? And so that's the reason why a lot of times people dread counsel when it comes to marriage. Because 10 out of 10 times that we've counseled with somebody pertaining to marriage, what is the thing that will always come out? Wait. Have you ever given a marriage counsel where you didn't tell somebody to wait? Kadar, have you ever given a marriage counsel where you didn't tell somebody to wait? No. And so when you understand that, don't get it twisted. Brothers and sisters understand they've been around, especially the ones that have been around us for a long time. They already know what the counsel is going to be in many cases, which is why they fear and dread the counsel because the council will always at some point in time be to wait. But the thing is, is that a lot of times when brothers and sisters hear that word wait, in their mind, they translate it to you saying no. And you didn't say no. You just said, not right now. Wait. And everything that needs to be understand, understood, you will come to understand. And everything that needs to be known will be known. And, you know, I'll give an example of um, a brother who was in a situation similar to that at one point in time. And he waited. It was, um, remember one time, one time the brother Anthony was about to get married. Brother Anthony came to us and was like, yo, I want to get married. So let's explain the situation and stuff. He had, he had his house, he had, he, we told him, you know, get some things in order as far as his job is concerned and things like that. But spiritually, we was like, yo, spiritually, the brother's ready. You know, it wasn't anything spiritually that he was lacking. There were a few things we told him as far as carnally, get these things in order. But spiritually, it's like, yo, you're a good brother, you have a good reputation. Spiritually, there was nothing lacking that made us say, nah, we don't think so. But one of the things we told him was, wait, because the person that you're trying to get with may not be dealing the way you think they're dealing. And their dealings might not be on the up and up, but time is gonna reveal. And so what happened, he waited, and it did not take long before he realized that the person who he wanted to marry was not who and what he thought she was. You know, in fact, they pretty much left the church. And so, so it was revealed that, you know, this is something that you wanted, but you were willing to wait to see if things were going to play out the way you thought it was going to play out. You were willing to wait and see what the Most High was going to show and reveal. And that's why up above, in the scriptures we read in Ecclesiasticus, what did it say? And above all, pray to the Most High that he would direct thy paths in truth. And when a person commits themselves to that, the Most High is not going to not going to fail you. He's not going to let you down. He's going to show you the things that you need to know. But the thing is, is that oftentimes what people will do is they'll say, "Okay, well, I know I'm, I want to get in a relationship. I know I want to get married. So I know at some point I'm going to have to counsel." So what do they do? They try to counsel with the person who is the worst example or try to counsel with somebody that has the least understanding so that they can do what they want to do. And when it blows up, we say, like, listen, did you even get counsel? Oh, I got counsel. Who did you counsel with? Lucifer. <laughs> no. And you know what they do? Because I, 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 I give you an example, a better example than Lucifer. They will pick out newer brothers and sisters who they know don't fully have the understanding and sit in counsel with them. And they'll be like, yeah, I don't see what's wrong with that. Go ahead. And then the, then the next thing, when you say, hey, did you counsel? Yeah, I counsel with this brother or this sister. Well, why would you counsel with them knowing that they're brand new to the faith? Really, you should be counseling them. But now even your example is showing you shouldn't even be counseling them because you should know better than this. That's the slick stuff that people do. And, 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 and keep in mind, when we say these things, we are not speaking hypothetical situations. These are real live examples of things that people do when they want to fulfill their lust, 
they find a way to fulfill the scriptures, so-called, and fulfill their lust at the same time, but really all you're doing is fulfilling your lust. Right. And the dangerous thing is that um, go to um, 2 Samuel 2 and 13. <clears throat> because the real dangerous thing is that even though I'm sorry, 2 Samuel 13, and we're going to start at verse 1. But the real reason why that's dangerous, Kadar, is because oftentimes people will find the counselor that they're looking for. Mm -hmm. And if you search for somebody to justify your wickedness, it won't take long. You will find the counselor that you're looking for. And that's a dangerous thing. Like when you look in the scriptures, there are many examples of that. We're going to go to one example that's really wicked, but explains about what happens when a person finds the counselor that they're looking for. Oh, I see that look on your face, Kadar, so that means you saw it. I know. I know what it is. Go ahead. So this is an example of somebody finding the counselor that they're looking for. This is a brother that's overcome with a lust, and it's a wicked lust, but yet and still you're going to find a counselor. So let's see what counsel he got. So we starting at verse one? Yes, indeed. Second Samuel 13 and one. Mm. Second Samuel 13, verse one. And it came to pass after this, that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin. And Amnon thought that it was hard for him to do anything to her. So stop. So it's letting you know, it says that this man, he was sick with his love for Tamar. And we know that that word love is really substituted for what? Lust. So his lust for his sister was so great that it broke him. It made him, it made him sick. And he knew that there was no way he could fulfill that lust because it was his sister. Continue. Verse 3. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very subtle man. So stop. The scripture says, Be thou continually with a godly man, whom thou knowest to keep the commandments, and whose mind is according to thy mind and who will sorrow with thee if thou shalt miscarry, right? Right. But this man, who was his best friend? A subtle man. So it's letting you know that we have to really watch who we associate with and who we seek counsel of. Because if you know, like you, like how many of us have friends, like even friends in the world where it's like, you know what? They cool and I'm cool with them but I gotta watch them when they're around because they keep a lot of shady people around them all the time. And you have brothers like that who they, they're in the faith, but they keep counsel with a lot of shady people in the world. Or like Adar said, they'll keep counsel with people who are in the church, but not yet in the faith. You understand? They don't know Christ yet. They're in the process of learning. Continue. Verse um, verse four, and he said unto him, Why art thou, being the king's son, lean from the? Okay, sorry, let me read again. And he said unto him, Why art thou, being the king's son, lean from day to day? Wilt thou not tell me? And Amnon said unto him, I love Tamar my brother Absalom's sister. And Jonadab said unto him, lay thee down on thy bed and make thyself sick. And when thy father cometh to see thee, say unto him, I pray thee, let my sister Tamar come and give me meat and dress the meat in my sight that I may see it and eat it at her hand. So here it is, he confided in his son. I mean, he confided in his friend and told his friend about the wicked desires that he had and his wicked lust. And his friend didn't say, 
listen, dude, what are you thinking? That's a sin against the Most High, it's a sin against Christ. In the law of Moses, it tells us that you can't lay with your next of kin. None of that. None of that. Not one scripture, not one commandment, nothing. No rebuke. The scripture says you open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Right now, he is giving his friend those wicked, evil, deceitful kisses. And he's telling them, well, listen, if you want to do that, I'll tell you how to do it. And he literally counsels him on how to get his sister alone with him in that room. That's the wickedness of, of the wrong friend. That's the wickedness of seeking out the counsel that you're looking for. Continue. So Amnon lay down and made himself sick. And when the king was come to see him, Amnon said unto the king, I pray thee, let Tamar my sister come and make me a couple of cakes in my sight, that I may eat at her hand. Then David sent home to Tamar, saying, Go now to thy brother Amnon's house and dress him meat. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house, and when he was laid down, and she took flour and kneaded it and made him cakes and made cakes in his sight and did bake the cakes and she took a pan and poured them out before him but he refused to eat and amnon said have out all men from me and they went out every man from him mm. and amnon said unto tamar bring the meat unto the chamber that i may eat of thine hand and Tamar took the cakes which she had made and brought them unto the chamber to Amnon, her brother. And when she had brought them unto him to eat, he took hold of her and said unto her, come lie with me, my sister. And she answered him, nay, my brother, do not force me for no such thing ought to be done in Israel. Do not this, do not thou this folly. So when you look at what how is it all went down, keep in mind, this guy had a wicked lust on him and someone counseled him. He literally, so, so just keep in mind, we're talking about counsel right now. Because when the scriptures talk about who to counsel with, that's powerful. Because now, if this man, when he goes astray and commits this sin, can he say that he sought counsel? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he sought counsel. But who did he seek counsel of? He sought counsel of a wicked, evil, subtle man. Not the man that the scripture says he's supposed to be associated with. Not to be thou continually with a godly man whom thou knowest to keep the commandments. No, he counseled with a man that was probably just as evil or more wicked than himself. Continue. Verse 13, and I, whither shall I cause my shame to go? And as for thee, thou shalt be as one of those fools in Israel. Now therefore, I pray thee, speak unto the king, but he will not withhold me from thee. So now she's even trying to deal with him like, listen, just ask your, ask, ask our father. He's not going to, he's not going to hold you from me. So she's basically popped pleading because people ask about that sometimes it's not talking about how she really uh, of course she didn't think david was really going to give them together in marriage that would be against the law but still she's pleading with him like well just ask our father she's trying to do anything to get him to basically back off from his lust continue and and another point is and and if sorry if i repeated it i'm repeating this but she gave him the right counsel that was so he didn't want to hear the right counsel because he got what counsel from his buddy already mm -hmm. and because he wanted to deal with his lust he had two counsels at this point to deal with he could have dealt with the wicked counsel that this man gave him but or he could have dealt with the counsel that she gave him. and i just want to go to one quick point you probably know where i'm going bring it first corinthians chapter 10 verse 13 there have no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, 
but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. So, okay, we all have lust and we all have wicked desires that come into our minds or whatever have you. But the scriptures tells us that there's no temptation that's taking hold of us than such as is common to man because we all go through a lust or something at one point in our life. We all have thoughts of doing something that's contrary to the scriptures. But he also said that he will make a way and not give you, not, nothing will be put on you above that you're able to bear. So if you go into a lust or if you go into a sin, the scriptures tell you you can bear everything so what is it letting you know anything that we really go into that's a sin is because we gave in to our lust there's no excuse but then he also said with every temptation he's going to prepare a way that we may be able to escape it now people think it's something mystical uh you going to go commit adultery and all of a sudden the door shuts and you can't get out it's nothing mystical the example is right here. It's the word. Right when he was at the point of breaking the commandments and the strongest lust was upon him, that sister came with the word and said, uh-uh, you're not to do that. No, such a thing is not to be done in Israel. This is folly. But his lust was so strong that he said, to hell with this, I want my lust, and we'll see what he does. Does he listen to the counsel of his friend? which is going to give it, cause him to give into his lust, or does he listen to the counsel of his sister, which is according to the scriptures, so that he will not go off? Well, I think Kabbalah posted the scripture too, in Leviticus 18. But um, um, you can continue. So, um, 2 Samuel 13, and where were we? Um, so pick up in verse 14. Okay, 2 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14. Howbeit he would not hearken unto her voice, but being stronger than she, forced her and lay with her. So he didn't heart. so just like you said, here it was, the council came out, but he didn't hearken to her voice and went and did that wicked act. Continue. Then Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred wherewith he had hated her was greater than the love wherewith he had he, he had loved her. So why? Because it, it was because it wasn't love. It was all about lust, and that's the reason why the scripture says that the hatred that he had for her was greater than the love that he had once had for her. Because it was all it was never about love. It was always about lust, and that's the reason why even with a lot of brothers on the line from the wicked times in the world will remember times of putting women out the house and all of that stuff after you got what you wanted. And what was that about? It was about the same thing. The lust was fulfilled. And there was no reason for her to stay. So, Akra, I'm going to say something that you may not like. You said people in the world. Oh, I'm just, yeah. I, what about woo! truth? All right, I get it. That take wise and, and lust and haste and then after they get these wives, they hate her, hate them, and come to us for counsel, saying all manner of wickedness against the wives that they took in haste. And then we look at their brothers and we're like, nah, bro. We counseled you not to do that. We counseled you to wait. We counseled you to let sisters grow and let them grow in the spirit. And we're not talking about once or twice or three times. This is a pattern of things just according to what the scriptures say. Because they want to do something in haste and not wait and jump into things, then they get someone and they're gonna now, oh, she's a demon. You, well, you knew that before you dealt with her. That's why we told you to wait, have some patience. Let the most hard work with her. Let her grow, let her become a woman in Christ before you even contemplate this act of marrying her. Yeah, and so you're right, we've seen that happen many times and so when you look at when you look at that hatred that he had for her it said it surpassed all the love that he one time thought he had for her and what wickedness did he do next it goes very similar to what you brought out um oh and amnon said unto her arise be gone mm. 
kick rocks, hit the bricks, get get out of here. I don't want you no more. Yeah, read it. And she said unto him, there is no cause this evil, there is no cause this evil in sending me away is greater than the other that thou didst unto me. But he would not hearken unto her. Then he called his servants that ministered unto him and said, put now this woman out from me and bolt the door after her. And bolt the door after her. It's wicked as hell. And she, and she had a garment of diverse colors upon her, but with such robes were the king's daughters that were virgins apparel. Then his servants brought her out and bolted the door after her. So you see that? So we can stop right there. That's the whole point of the history. But when you look at that history and how it ended, that was a wicked man who got what? the counsel that he was looking for. He was a wicked man who got wicked counsel and used that to go and fulfill his lust. But what happens with lust once it's fulfilled? It never gives you what you're looking for. And that's the reason why that whole thing blew up. And for those of you who don't know the history, you can read it, but it ended with Amnon being put to death. He died for that sin. And so when you look at what the scripture is showing us is that not only is it about like we were talking about the whole thing about waiting and the patience and the counsel and things like that but even with the aspect of counsel you have to make sure that you're counseling with the right people because you, you look for somebody that's going to just basically confirm your lust and tell you how to fulfill your lust like that man Jonah Dad, then what's going to happen you're going to find that same fate of death and so as we start talking about that delayed gratification and that patience and that waiting, a lot of people that don't want to wait, they either have, they have a few choices they can make. They can go into fornication or they could go into those bad marriages or those failures or those sham that they call marriages. But either way, it's still going to be the folly that the scriptures speak of. So just speaking on the fornication aspect of it first, like let's go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter seven. As a matter of fact, I'm just gonna reference that because it's, there's too much to go into. But in 1 Corinthians chapter seven, that's what Paul basically explains that um, I would that all men were even after, as myself, but every man has their gift to the most high, some after this man and some after the other man because Paul himself was a eunuch. But he basically explained to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, let every woman have her own husband. And when they started talking about that, right, when he started speaking, um, actually seven. Okay, there we go. So when he basically was saying that to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and every woman have her own husband. And he also goes into the point of but if they cannot contain, let them marry for it is better to marry than to burn. And just to make sure that everybody understands, burning in your lust is not the prerequisite for marriage. It's not one of those things where you basically say, okay, well, I'm burning, then that means I need to be just, I can be justified in like going out and finding a woman and laying down. That's not what it's about. Because even though when Paul is explaining, like, listen, not everybody has the gift of being a you. We already understand that. So he's saying that if that's not something you can do, then it's not against the law for you to get married. But it's not one of those things where he says, okay, well, you're burning. Well, then that means just go find anybody and everybody and just lay down. Because that, and sad thing, Kadar, that was counsel that was given in the past too by the elders that we had. Well, we had elders in the church that basically used to quote that to brothers. Well, listen, the scriptures say it's better to marry than to burn. And it would be brothers like, listen, you know, I don't know what to do. You know, I, I, I can't fight my lust. And brothers would be like, well, listen, you know, that sister's over there. She's not married. Go marry her. Well, I really don't like her. Well, the scripture says it's better to marry than to burn. So then what happened? Just like that wicked counsel that was given to Amnon. They go and marry the sister use her as a tool to fulfill their lust, but after the lust is fulfilled, now they don't like them. 
And we've seen that happen to a brother. If DeWatt is on the line, DeWatt will know exactly who we're talking about. Because we're not blowing up brother spots. I know the brother ain't in the church. We haven't seen him in, um, I haven't seen him in almost 20 years. But that happened to a brother where he got counsel from the elders to deal with his sister. And he lay with her, married her. And afterwards, he got over his burning, but he hated her. It was like, oh, she fat. She ugly. She, I hate her nose. When she go to sleep, she snore. Her nose is turned up like a pig. She looked like Miss Piggy. He used to say some horrible stuff about his wife and hated the woman. But when he was fulfilling his lust, he didn't hate her. When it was a matter of it's better to marry than to burn, he didn't hate her. But it just goes to show the difference between love and lust. And if you're given into your lust, it's only going to end badly. Go to the book of Hebrews chapter 13 and 4. Because there are other people who are not even going to do that. What are they going to do? They're going to go out and start dealing with people in the world. They're going to go out and fornicate. And the thing is about that fornication, it's only going to lead them to destruction. Hebrews 13 and 4 is just one verse, but it's powerful and it says everything that needs to be said. Hebrews 13 and 4, you can read that, Kadar. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. For whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. So when you look at what the scripture says about marriage, the most I says marriage is honorable. Marriage is honorable in every way. There's nothing wrong with marriage. There's nothing wrong with with married couples coming together. And it says, and the bed is undefiled. Because, you know, in the church, a lot of times people teach this whole thing about sex being impure and unclean and evil and things like that. That's not what the scripture says. The scripture says it's, the marriage is honorable in every way. And the bed between the bed between a married man and a woman is undefiled. But what? Whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. But the most I will judge whoremongers and adulterers. So, like we were saying, like there are people in the world and, we, and many people that claim to be in the faith who will go into the sins of whoremongering and adulteries. And when they do that, the scripture says, the most high will judge it. And so, just dealing with a few more scriptures to, to close out the whole topic of the fornication. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and start at verse 15. Because the thing is, is that even when we deal with like a lot of younger brothers and sisters of the faith that get caught up in that, because like, you know, we try to deal with, um, we deal with the judgment of the Most High, but we try to deal with it in the guidelines that Christ explained to us about and when you read Matthew the 23rd chapter, he speaks about judgment, mercy, and faith. And so there have been times when we have young brothers and young sisters get caught up in situations where we're like, listen, we know that you're still learning Christ. We know that you're still trying to understand a lot of things. We're not making no excuses for sins. We're not sweeping your sins under the rug. But we know that we're not condemning you to death. And we're not telling you to leave the church but we have to reprove and correct the wickedness that you're dealing with. And understand that even though we're reproving and correcting the wickedness that you're dealing with, the Most High is still the ultimate judge. So in 1 Corinthians um, 6, and we're gonna start at verse 15, this is what the Most High, and this is what Christ, is, the Most High Christ explained to us pertaining to the sin of fornication and why it's so grievous of a sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15. Know ye not that your bodies are the member of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. So stop. So when you look at what he's bringing out right there, Paul, the Apostle Paul is explaining, our bodies belong to Christ. We are members of the body of Christ. Christ is part of us. So if the spirit of Christ is in us and dwells in us, 
can we take this body that belongs to Christ and make it the member of a harbor and join it to a harbor? And he says, God forbid. But that's the same reason why it explained in the book of Wisdom of Solomon chapter one, that what? The Holy Spirit will flee the seat. And it says that that Holy Spirit will not dwell in a body that's subject to sin. So you got the Holy Spirit on you? Hey, there's a harlot over there. I think I'm gonna have sex with her. The Holy Spirit is leaving. It's leaving. It's not gonna stay. It's not gonna stay because it can't stay. Because what you're literally saying is that you're going to take the Holy Spirit and make it the member and part of the body of a harlot. It cannot happen. It will never happen. The Holy Spirit will depart from you every single time. And that's the reason why is Paul is asking the question like, listen, do you honestly think that you could take the body of Christ and join it to a harlot? Because the scripture says that two are gonna become what? One flesh. Wasn't that the law of marriage? Two becoming one flesh. But that's why he explained it. It can't be done in the case of a marriage between this man and a harlot. Continue verse 18. Verse 18. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. So every sin that we commit is outside of our body. Whether it be stealing, this, that, anything you do, that's something outside of your body. But Paul is explaining that when you fornicate, when you commit adultery, when you join your body to a harlot or any like such thing along that path of fornication, he says you're sinning against your own body. And there's a reason why he says it. Read 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are brought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So now it's going into what Paul is explaining. You are bought with a price. Your body is the temple of Christ. He lives in you and he dwells in you. And the price that was paid for you was the blood of Christ. So Christ laid out his life and purchased us for himself. And being that he purchased us for himself, we belong to him. How are we going to take our bodies now that belong to Christ and give them to sin? And give it to sin? That's why he's explaining why fornication is such a grievous sin for us to commit against our body. Because we're sinning against, sinning against our own flesh and we're defiling the property of Christ. From there, we're going to go to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. And this is one of your favorite scriptures, Kadar. And I'll let you bring it out because I always love the way you explain it. So, Hebrews chapter 12, and I'm going to start at verse 16, explaining the other aspect of that fornication that that comes out. And keep in mind the and keep in mind the thing that we started with at the beginning of the class. How this gentleman is explaining about oh this whole new concept of the mushroom the marshmallow test and delayed gratification but no you didn't make that up you didn't make that up you didn't stumble upon nothing new you didn't create no new doctrine the scriptures told us about denying self the scriptures told us about these things ages ago millennia ago the most high in christ told us about that about denying self so this is the book of hebrews chapter 12 and I'm gonna read 16 and 17. And it reads, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterwards, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. So when you look at this, and it's going into, when you go back to Genesis, how Esau came in and saw Jacob cooking the stewed meat and he was hungry. And he was like, listen, this is some, you know, Jacob's like, yo, hold up, I'm still cooking. And he was like, listen, he's famished, he's about to die. And so he gave up 
his birthright. He said, listen, you can have my birthright for this piece of red meat. Now, when you look at that example and it's talking about patience, if he had just waited and let the meat cook, seeing that Jacob was his brother, would he not have still gotten that, that, that meat? And the answer is what? Yes. But what happened? Because he was so impatient and because he wanted it right then and there, he wanted that gratification in that moment. What did he do? He gave away his birthright. He gave away everything he had for one small morsel of meat. And when you look at that in the context of fornication, which is what it's going into, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright, that's the same thing that we do when we go into giving away our birthright for what? Fornication. Giving away our lives and our chance at the kingdom of heaven for one piece of meat. And I hate to say it that way because that's what we used to call it in the world anyway. Give me some meat. And so now for that piece of meat, for a night of fornication, for a few minutes of fornication, you give up something that is what? Eternal. You get a few minutes of pleasure, if that, and then what happens? Your whole eternal life, your, your life and entering into the kingdom of heaven, something that would have been an eternity, was given up for something that was temporary and of no consequence. Verse 17, for ye know that how that afterwards, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. So because of his decision, now instead of receiving the blessing of being the firstborn and all that, he was rejected. And that's what we do when we give in to our lust and fornication and so forth, because now we're going to be rejected and not inherit the kingdom of heaven for what? That small moment in time. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. So you, we can play games, but we don't know the kind of mercy that we have. And the fact that the Most High gave us mercy from all the things that we did in the world and then we came in the truth, if we come and commit the same things again, there's not going to be a place found of repentance, though you can cry about it. Oh, I messed up. Most High made a mistake. No, you didn't. You did not make a mistake. You planned it out. You did whatever you could do to get it. And then you did it. And now that you did it, you found out what? You don't want it as much as you wanted it. But now you're saying, oh, this wasn't worth it, but it's too late. Everybody was telling you it wasn't worth it up until the point that you committed the sin. Once you committed the sin, there's nothing we can do to help you. And you are now in the most high in Christ's hands. And so you can do whatever you can do. But you that's it's, it's too late at that point. We can't help you. Right. And so when you look at that whole thing, we explain to people and explain to brothers and sisters and because sisters go out and fornicate too. Then you say explain about this, that weight. It's about the denying self. So they tried to use fancy terms when we've looked at the video at the beginning. We have to learn how to deny gratification. No, Christ said, no, he said delay gratification. Christ said, deny yourself. Mm. That's what it's always been about. And so for the brothers and sisters that can't deny themselves, or for any among us that fall into that trap of not being able to, we're gonna go after our lust. And we just went through many examples of what happens when someone den cannot deny themselves and goes after their lust. Many times we see brothers and sisters go out and want it. But as it pertains to marriage, we see many people that rush and go into those marriages like we explained at the beginning of the class. So one of the things I we were bringing out at the beginning was, yeah, that might give you the husband or the wife that you're looking for, but it won't give you the marriage that you're looking for. This is the type of marriage that you're gonna wind up getting. Ecclesiasticus chapter 25. And I think Kakum, did you have a point to bring out? Oh yeah, I heard Kakum might come on. Candy bar, come. Mute them back. 
Ecclesiasticus 25 and Ecclesiasticus chapter 25 and we're going to start at verse 13 because we're going to see exactly what happens what oftentimes we deal with these cases where you might counsel a brother or a sister about the things they're getting into and then they get the mat they get the woman or the man that they want but they don't get the marriage that they want verse 13 Ecclesiastes 25 verse 13 give me any plague but the plague of the heart and any wickedness but the wickedness of a woman and any affliction but the affliction from them that hate me and any revenge but the revenge of enemies read it on continue there's no head above the head of a serpent and there's no wrath above the wrath of an enemy so the scripture says, give me any plague but the plague of the heart and any wickedness but the wickedness of a woman. And then it goes into the affliction and wrath and revenge and the head of a serpent. But the same way you're facing the wrath of an enemy or the bite of a serpent, that's the same way it is for having to face the wickedness of a woman, especially when you're bound together in marriage. Verse 16. I had rather dwell with a lion and a dragon than to keep house with a wicked woman. So the scriptures tell you that this is, and this is speaking from um, Jesus, the son of Sirach, one of the wisest men to live. And he's basically saying that it, he would rather dwell with a lion or a dragon than to keep house with a, than to keep house with with, with a wicked woman. Continue. The wickedness of a woman, excuse me, hit the mouse, goodness sakes. Uh -oh. Yeah, verse um, 17. Sorry, okay. The wickedness of a woman changeth her face and darkeneth her countenance, countenance like a sackcloth. So you've seen that when, when they get angry, how the whole face can change and darken. Even the most beautiful of women, when that spirit is there, the only thing you see is that hatred that they have for you. Like, like Beyonce at the Super Bowl. Verse 18, her husband shall sit among his neighbors and when he heareth it shall sigh bitterly. And so how many times do you have you had to sit down and counsel with that brother? who every time you have to sit down and have that counsel, it's the same counsel like, y'all just don't understand. Y'all just don't understand how evil she is. Y'all don't understand how wicked she is. Y'all don't understand, y'all just don't understand. And that's that bitterness, that sigh, why? Because of how everything played out and because of how everything went down and we're on the other side, powerless to do anything about it. Continue. Verse 19, all wickedness is but little to the wickedness of a woman. Let the portion of a sinner fall upon her. So all wickedness is little compared to the wickedness that she can do. Why? Because when the scriptures speak about the power of a woman, especially like when you read the book of Proverbs, um, Proverbs 31, when it speaks about the virtuous woman, it tells you that that virtuous woman literally builds the house with her hands. She literally builds the whole house and maintains it. And she maintains her husband. The scriptures also describe her as a pillar of rest and a comfort. Genesis describes her as a help that's meet for her husband. So imagine if you will, all of those things in reverse, where she's not a help that's being, she's not a pillar of rest, she's not building up, she's tearing down, she's not a comfort, she's an affliction. She has the power to break a man and bring him to nothing. That's the power that women have. They could build a man up to be a king, or they could break him down to nothing. A piece of bread. What's that, um, Godawa? A piece of bread. Right. By means of a horsewoman, a man is brought to a piece of bread. Let's say it to the Lord. So, 
pick up in um, verse 19 again and read 19 and 20 together. All wickedness is but little to the wickedness of a woman. Let the portion of a sinner fall upon her. As the climbing up a sandy way is to the feet of the age, so is a wife full of words to a quiet man. And so when you look at the way the Mosai explains the things and analogies in the scriptures, that is just one of the ultimate examples. Because if you've ever been on a beach or anywhere where it's like a sandy, sandy hills and stuff like that, as a young man, it's hard to climb up those things. Now, it's, you, it's possible, but the reason why it's hard is because every time you try to move, you're sliding back down. And every time you're trying to progress, you feel like you're going back, you're pretty much your wheels are spinning, but nothing is going. And if you fight hard enough, you can make it up to the top, but by the time you get there, you're gonna be totally exhausted. Now imagine an old man, because that's what the scripture says, the feet of the age. Now imagine an old man trying to do that same thing. He's just, Stepping, 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 but he's never going to get anywhere. He's never going to make any progress. And the only thing it's going to do is tire him out in exhaustion and bitterness and depression and failure. And that's what it feels like. And the scripture is saying is that's what it feels like when you're in a marriage for a quiet man with a woman that's full of words. Basically, what the world calls a nagger. Who are these people? Who are people that annoy you? <laughs> <laughs> these people really annoy you. Who are they? Naggers. Right. <laughs> and, and so... And, and I like that you just said the word that there's no progress. Because every time you think that everything is going fine, you do. You deal with them in the scriptures, you show them this is the way you're supposed to conduct yourself, you're telling them, yo, let's fellowship with, you need to fellowship with other sisters, you need to build yourself up, things will get quiet for a minute, and you think that you've made progress, and when you turn around, you sliding back down that hill once again. Mm -hmm. That's, That's what it sandy, is, huh? Sandy, sandy climb. A sandy climb. A sandy climb. So, so, move on, there's more. Okay, um, verse 21. 20, 20. Stumble not at the beauty of a woman and desire her not for pleasure. So now, and notice that, notice that these scriptures are connected for a reason. It's not like these scriptures are out of context. All of them are connected for a reason because it's letting you know Who's the man who's going to get this lion and dragon? Who's the man that's going to be walking up this sandy climb? Who's the man that's going to deal with that serpent's head? Is the man that's desiring this woman for pleasure. He stumbled. So he knows what the right path is. He knows what the scriptures are showing him. He knows what a true wife is, but what did he do? He stumbled. He went into his own lust, and instead of dealing with the scriptures and what the scriptures say a wife is, he went for the beauty. And he went for what? The pleasure. So he saw a fine woman with the butt, the breasts, and everything else, just like he likes it, and that's what he went for instead of a righteous woman. Right. So you fell. You made a mistake. And so when you so when you look at that, it says desire not for pleasure. And so, like you said, he fell into the trap, and now you gotta live with it. Verse 22. A sandy climb. A sandy climb. A, a beautiful woman makes for a sandy climb. A beautiful <laughs> wicked woman. <laughs> I mean, you forgot the, the other thing, he fell for those things that were precious in her, like the other scripture says. Absolutely. Post it in the chat room. Gotta find it. I think it's nine. Checks um, Ecclesiastes nine. So now pick up in verse 22. A woman, if she maintain a husband, is full of anger, impudence, and much reproach. And so the thing is, is this. Oftentimes we would read that scripture and say, oh, see, if a woman take care of a man, then, you know, 
she's going to hate him. No, it's still talking in the same vein that you read up above. It's talking about a wicked woman that has hatred for her husband. Because you've seen examples in the scriptures. Uh, the most famous is going to be probably Tobit and Anna. When Tobit wound up blind for eight years, Anna took care of him. You know, she did a woman's work, and when, you know, and when he needed to be reproved and corrected, she did the reproving and the correcting, but it was never a disrespect. She still loved him and took care of him and maintained him until the Mosai blessed him to get his sight back. And so when you look at that, it says a woman, if she maintain her husband, is full of anger, impudence, and much reproach. Because you had situations, and you have situations, where you might have a brother in the faith who has either fallen on hard times, lost a job, got sick, or situations that came up where he's not able to work and not able to be a, the type of provider that she may be used to, you understand? Or things have happened where he might be transitioning between jobs or might be in a situation where going to school, working for a better, to, to, to plan for a better job, whatever the situation is. And here it is, he might have a wife that's actually taking care of the house during that time. But if they give into that wickedness or if they have a wicked spirit in them, the scripture says they're going to be full of anger. They're going to be full of impudence and much reproach, which means they're going to be bold. They're going to be disrespectful. They're going to be rude. They're going to be angry with you. And why? Because they are in a position where they're taking care of bills or they're taking care of a car note or they're taking care of the groceries and things like that. Whereas you have the examples of the righteous women, they're like, listen, they'll run a household because according to Proverbs 31, they doing it anyway. You understand? They already running the household. But when you're dealing with, why are you laughing? Uh, nothing. Because when you look at Proverbs 31, they're already running the household. They're, they're, when this talks about the Proverbs 31 woman, they're literally already running the household. But when you look at the wicked woman, it's basically explaining that if she give, if she buys some groceries, she mad. You understand? If she has to pay a bill, she mad. If she has to take care of things out, she's mad. And if you're not able to contribute, she's mad. And what happens is now you're in a situation where it says she's full of anger, impudence, and much reproach. What's up, Godown? Uh she mad when you tell her when when you do what she asks you to do, she's still mad. But you need to help more. So you help more. She's mad that you help more. Why are you helping more? So it's on it's on every level. But I I, I want to and I, I want to jump in on that point because Agra, you brought out Proverbs thirty one, right? I did. And how the woman is taking care of the household and doing all these things. She and is. So she's not. This woman is taking care of the household. She's not angry. But why is she not angry? Is another piece to that because it's another scripture and we'll get to it at another point i'll find it later it tells you a portion of a wicked woman is given to a portion of a wicked man so that proverbs 31 woman is dealing with a what a righteous man so she's happy to do these things but this man here who stumbled at her beauty and dealing in wickedness and lust you think she don't know it and now you don't want to work you a lazy dude you bumming around well, a portion of a wicked woman is given to a portion of a wicked man. Y'all both dealing with that wickedness. So that's why the things are not working out. Because there's going to be times, perhaps, in a relationship, there can be times where a man may fall on hard times and then the woman picks up the slack, like the example with Tobin. Mm -hmm. But the woman is going to understand, listen, my man is just down for a, a moment. He's a righteous man. He's been doing all these things for so long. It's time for me to take care of him for a, take care of him for a moment, and right. vice versa. But that's vice versa in a relationship that is built on the Most High in Christ, and that's why we're talking about the importance of just waiting. 
waiting and letting each other grow in Christ before you commit to a marriage so that it'll be a portion of a righteous man given to a portion of a, a portion of a righteous woman and you can go grow and go together in Christ. Right. Continue. Hey, so, I cry. Yes, bro. Let, let me just make a real quick point. I just want to make a point before y'all go on. You made a point yet, uh, earlier about how the, the woman has the power and the strength to do certain things, build them up or tear them down. And the, the point that I want, I don't want the sisters to understand because sometimes, you know, sisters get to that thing about, you know, in this world they teach you not to submit to a man. Oh, this is sort of, you're almost going to this misogynistic doctrine and so on and so forth. How is it misogynistic? And the woman has the power to destroy you as a man. What misogynistic doctrine is that? I'm trying to figure it out. What it is is you just have to use the right power to build up and not tear down. That was it. Oh, Jesus. So, verse um, 23, Kadon. Going right into the point. Yeah. <laughs> A wicked woman abateth the courage, maketh an heavy countenance, and a wounded heart. A woman that will not comfort her husband in distress maketh weak hands and feeble knees. So when you look at that, it says a wicked woman abateth the courage. And keep in mind, what we spoke about is that when you have a, a the virtuous woman is just the opposite. Is just the opposite. Because when you have a virtuous woman, she thinks that you could do anything. And she's going to encourage you to do anything. It don't matter. You want to be an astronaut? She she believes you can do it. You know, all the thing, all of these things. But ultimately, in a in a righteous example, like for the kingdom of heaven, when you are on those hard times, when your courage fails, when your faith is failing, they are that pillar of rest. They are that support that encourage you. Remember, that's why I love the example of even Tobit and Anna. When Tobit was blind for those eight years. And please read the book of Tobit if you're unfamiliar with it. When Tobit was blind for eight years, it tells you that Anna took up woman's work. So she was making, it doesn't tell you exactly what she was making, but she was making items and selling it to people. When it came time for her to get paid, one of the people paid her her wages and also gave her a kid, like a, a lamb or a goat, it doesn't say exactly which one. When Tobit heard the animal in the house, he was upset because he thought she stole it. And he rebuked her, like, give it back for, is it not, is it not stolen? Give it. And she had to rebuke him. She's like, listen, where are all your alms deeds? Where are all your, your righteous deeds and your alms? And she explained to him, she's like, Yo, your good deeds are known. So what she was explaining to him is, look, look, you have done so much good for so many people. Why is it so hard for you to understand that people would want to do good for you? You understand? So she had to build him up and basically explain, like, listen, you are bugging out right now. I'm still your wife. I would never break the commandments. I would never steal. But this is the result of your good deeds. The fact that somebody's willing to bless us this way is a result of what you did and your reputation. That's what it looks like. But it says a wicked woman abates the courage. So she takes it all away and convinces you that you're nothing, that you're not worthy to be loved. They will break you. They will emasculate you. That's what happens. And that's why I told you that she abated the courage, maketh a heavy countenance and a wounded heart. Because men, men can play tough. Like, you don't have feelings and emotions and stuff. Nah. The scriptures tell you that if you hit somebody with the, with the whip, you'll make a mark on the flesh. It says, but words break bones. So, some of the, so for the sisters, some of the things that will come out of your mouth can break a man to powder. I cry. Let me just give a few examples. Um, you're, not a man. you're not a man. Um, 
Uh, another good one is, uh, oh, this brother is better than you. He teach better than you. He look better than you. Um, even going back, even going back to one West where sisters used to compare sizes, and I'll just I'll just leave it there. Yeah. So yeah, it's some really hurtful things that sister can say to really like destroy a man, discourage to he's like weak, he can't really operate as he should, yeah. and it's really. really People don't understand, like you tearing down that man, that same man, you're going to need him to do things. So once they've teared down the man, now they're like, well, uh, I want to go on vacation. I want to do this. I want to do that. But you just the same man that you want to get everything from, you're destroying him. Oof. And Kadar knows, I mean, when we, we've heard some epic things that, that have been said to husbands. Um, this one sister in the church told her husband one time, like, listen, I'm only going to that church because of somebody else that I'm interested in. And said it. She said it. And Kadar got that look on his face, like, because he know what I'm talking about. She said, I'm saying, there's somebody else in that church I want. And that's her husband that's in the church. So when it talks about that will break the count and break you, heavy heart, wound wounded countenance, all that. So finish off 23. A wicked woman abateth the courage, maketh an heavy countenance, and a wounded heart. A woman that will not comfort her husband in distress, maketh weak hands and feeble knees. Because every man is going to have a time in his life when he's in distress. It's part of the conditions of the battle. It's part of the enduring to the end. It's part of the patience and tribulation. We're all going to see distress. It's inevitable. But if you're blessed to have a wife, not every brother has a wife. If you're blessed to have a wife, it's letting you know that the reason why she's that blessing is because she's going to be that pillar of rest and strength through the times of distress. She's gonna strengthen and encourage you through it. But it says that there's a wicked woman that she will not comfort her husband in distress, but gives him weak hands and feeble knees. If you have weak hands and feeble knees, think about that. How are you even gonna work your way out of the affliction if your strength is already broken? You can't, because you see that happen with people where they already low, then what strength they have is broken, and they can't even find a way to work out of the situation that they're in. Continue. Read 24 and 25. Yeah, I'm sorry, I was jumping to, I was jumping somewhere else. No, read 20, 20, um, 24 to 26. Just read it straight away. All right, hold on a sec. What chapter are we in again? <laughs> We're in Ecclesiastes 25. Sorry. No, that's cool. You must have had something good. I'll, I'll tell you what I was thinking of later. It says, um, a wicked woman abateth the courage, maketh the heavy countenance, and a wounded heart. A woman that will not comfort her husband in distress, maketh weak hands and feeble knees. Of the woman came the beginning of sin, and through her we all die. Give the water no passage, neither a wicked woman liberty to gad abroad. If she go not as thou wouldest have her, Cut her off from thy flesh and give her a bill of divorce and let her go. Ooh, so that was the main scripture that people would come to. It's like, she's doing all this wickedness, all this evil. But what did you read up above, Kadar? You made an interesting observation. Stumble not at the beauty and desire not for pleasure, right? Mm -hmm. So now you've done that. And now all this evil comes and it's like, well, bill of divorce. Let me get divorced and get rid of her. But then Christ came back in Matthew 19 and put a screeching halt to that madness. Real quick, Matthew 19. Matthew 19, and we're just gonna go right to the point. We're not reading the whole thing. Matthew 19, we're gonna go right to verse seven when they asked Christ about the bill of divorce. Matthew chapter 19, verse seven. 
They said unto him, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? He said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. So right then, he's letting them know, it ain't no divorce. It ain't no divorce. You're not going nowhere. Except to be for fornication, the marriage stands. Now, that blew their mind so bad that what was the next question they asked him? Oh. Well, what was the statement? Read. His disciples say unto him, if the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. So now they're like, well, dang, if that's what marriage is, it's not good to marry. Now, what did Christ have to tell them after that? But read, he, read 12. I'm sorry, read, um, 11. Read, read 11 and 12. But he said unto them, all men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuch for the kingdom of heaven's sake. So for the people that's on the phone that maybe are familiar with what that term means, um, when you read the first eunuch that it speaks about, which were from their mother's womb, it's basically like when you read in the scriptures a person that may be born with crushed testicles or whatever, where they pretty much cannot perform sex. Then the second eunuchs, which were made eunuchs by men, like you would read about the different captivities where you had the men that were castrated in different captivities and they were made eunuchs by men in those different captivities. But the kind that you see in the faith is when it says, but there are some eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake, which would be people like John the Baptist, people like Paul, people like Christ himself, which basically just cut that whole aspect of their lives out and says they dedicated themselves to serving the Most High Holy. But think of how crazy that is that when they heard that that there was no bill of divorce, they were literally saying like, well, the only other option might be not to get married at all. That just shows you that the level of understanding that they had in marriage still had to grow by leaps and bounds. Keep in mind, this is in the Gospels. This is before 1 Corinthians 7 was written. This is before Ephesians um, 5 was written. And all these other things were written explaining about what the true marriage is as far as understanding Christ, because all those things had not happened yet. So that's why Christ had to explain, like, no, like, Y'all not, Christ already knew like, pretty much like, listen, probably none of y'all here stand here as eunuchs. So y'all just gotta understand, y'all gotta deal right in marriage. Cause that's what the main point was. And so the scriptures that we just now went over covered a lot of things from the aspect of these men giving into these marriages. What, okay, what did I miss? Nothing, nothing. You being wicked again? I'm teaching the class. Yeah, he'd be, he be a wicked, right? You see. So, a lot of the scriptures that we just went over have dealt with the whole aspect of brothers getting into these marriages and having to deal with wicked women and how hard, hard it is and how painful it is to deal with. But don't get it twisted. The same thing happens on the other end of the spectrum where sisters get involved with men that ain't about nothing. So, now, let's go to the state in the book of Ecclesiasticus and go to chapter 7. And we're going to read one verse, 7 and 25. And let's get the balance and the understanding of what's going on a lot of times. Because there are times we tell sisters to wait too. Like, listen, sis, that ain't the one. Wait. And what happens? Well, let's find out. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and read verse 25. Oh, that's interesting because Dinah had a little a little commentary said this is old fashioned right before class. See how the most really? of work? Really? <laughs> okay, let's wow. 
Well, let's talk about old fashioned then. Right before class, I hope Donna's listening. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 25. Now I hear somebody running down the steps. Too late. Marry thy daughter, and so shalt thou have performed a weighty matter. But give her to a man of understanding. Woo! The scripture says that if you marry your daughter, you perform the weighty matter. It's heavy. It's deep. And see, I can only speculate, but I got many brothers on the line who our fathers, some of you have married your daughter. Hell, could come ma married off his daughter, you know? So you got some brothers that can speak from experience, you know? Hayat married off his daughter. So, you know, there's brothers that understand what that looks like. And when you look at what it says, it says, give her to a man of understanding. Why do you want to marry your daughter to a man of understanding? Because when you look at, especially from a father's perspective, from the time your daughter's born, she's under your care. Nobody will care for her the way you do. And nobody will watch over her the way you do. And when she goes from your household into her husband's house, she's now under the care of the husband. Who would knowingly and willfully send their daughter into the house of a fool? or a person that is not in the commandments or does not love the Most High Christ. But what happens is a lot of the sisters don't want to abide by the wisdom of the scriptures either. And they basically just were like, I'm gonna go where I wanna go, choose who I wanna choose, be with who I wanna be with, out of love. But really, the same way we reprimanded that man, talking about that wasn't really love, that's lust, the sisters have to understand that too the danger about going after their lusts because they're going to run into the exact same situation. Ecclesiasticus 27. Hold, hold on, bro. You got something to bring up? Oh, in that scripture right there, too, is also when it says, marry thy daughter and so shalt thou perform the weighty matter. So it's, and all the time, it's not just a matter of a wicked person versus someone that's not wicked. Because it could be a brother or someone in the truth. And when you look at the way knowing your daughter from birth and knowing the way a brother is or, or isn't, you might understand, like, listen, that's not your personality. That's not even someone that you would be interested in. I could see you having issues because of this and because of that. And you need to consider this and consider that in marriage and not just be looking at how this person looks at the time or how you like them or not. So it's a weighty matter because, yeah, we, I mean, listen, it's plenty of single brothers and sisters in the church. That don't mean that they all compatible. They got to be righteous, but they also have to be that man or that woman that the Most High has made for that brother or for that sister. So those are things to consider as well when you're going to marry your daughter. Hey, the dog. Can I add into? Yeah. Or he, or it might be somebody in this church, right? <laughs> but the scriptures, the understanding of how a husband ought to be is for him, but he's not actually doing those things. What I mean by that, <clears throat> he's not diligent to make sure. Okay, if he's got a house, is it up and running? Is it up right? Okay, I'm planning to have someone here. Am I, am I doing the things there to put, uh, to provide for, for uh, a wife, for a family that's coming? Okay, you, if, you, if you have that slothfulness in you, how are you gonna be with the wife that you already saw? Okay, if you got that selfishness, it's just all about you, right? And not thinking of others, how are you gonna be with a wife? So in that weighty matter could be that that father looking at that and be like, no, nah, this yeah, he's here, but he ain't ready. Because he's not showing the fruit that he's ready. So now you looking at him because he looks good to your eyes, but I'm looking at it, he doesn't look good to me because of his actions, like Christ said, you'll know a man by his fruit. That's all. No praises, John. May, may I say something about? Go ahead, bro. Um, another way they matter is um, the man or the woman might be interested in the other individual, 
but they not be they might not be interested in, in your child in, uh, in raising your child that, that's there so that's another way to matter where it's all about the mother or the father that didn't marry but not about the rest of the family also what you're speaking about is the cases where somebody is bringing in going into a marriage and they already have children correct yes yeah, thank you okay so the scriptures addresses that too. Um, yeah, y'all know the chapter and verse. Um, whoever gets it first, just post it in the chat room. But um, what Rudy is basically talking about is um, um, be as a father to the fatherless instead of a uh, husband to the mother. And so should the most I love you more than your own mother does. Four and 10. Yeah, thank you for posting that. Um, read that before you post it too, Kadar. Ecclesiasticus chapter 4, verse 10. Be as a father unto the fatherless, and instead of an husband unto their mother. So shalt thou be as the son of the Most High, and he shall love thee more than thy mother does. So, of course, that, that pretty much goes into, if you're in a situation where you're marrying a sister or a brother that already has children, then you have to be able to accept them as your own and be part of that father to the fatherless or mother to the motherless because other, other than otherwise you're not fulfilling the love of Christ and that's not going to make for a, a marriage. So when you look at what was being brought out in Ecclesiasticus 7 and 25, marry thy daughter shall thou, shall thou perform the weighty matter but give her to a man of understanding. All the points that were brought out by the brothers Kadar, um, Yuanathan, and everything, is powerful points because when this woman is living with this man in his household, that is when you really get to see all the things that he's really dealing with. And if he's a fool, you're gonna find out really fast and it's gonna be a hard thing to deal with. And you know, there have been cases where where sisters have found out really, really bad things in, in, a, in a bad way. I'm sorry to be vague, but it's just one of those things where a lot of those experiences we've seen over the past 25 years, um, there was like one church where a brother was about to marry a sister and, you know, the church had a split. So out of spite, the brother, instead of letting his daughter marry who she was supposed to marry, he married her to somebody else out of spite. Well, guess what? He married her to a fool. Mm. He married her to somebody that has no interest in her. He basically sits around playing video games all day long and not taking care of his house. And now he has to watch his daughter suffering in that situation. You made that situation. You did that. You know, so it's a lot of things like that that happen when you when your daughter is not given to a man of understanding, but a man that does not love her or fear the most high Christ. Go to the book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter 27. And in the book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter 27, we're just going to read one verse. And it just shows you the danger of what happens when a sister gets married to the wrong man. Because we spend enough time talking about the man and the things he has to deal with with this wicked woman. But what can a man do? Woo! Ecclesiasticus 27. And verse three, just one verse. All right. Unless a man hold himself diligently in the fear of the Lord, his house shall soon be overthrown. And so what happens is sometimes these marriages, well, sisters will come to realize that these men do not fear the Most High in Christ. And they do not hold their household diligently in the fear of the Most High in Christ. And they are also, according to the and scriptures, unto them, also, yea, and he never read out of the mouth of babe. Okay. I'll say, so in Ecclesiasticus um, 27 and 3, it says, unless a man holds himself diligently in the fear of the Lord, that house is soon going to be overthrown. And so some sisters are going to find out the hard way that these brothers out here, not every brother is who they think they are. And some men is like super villains. They just want to see the world burn. They will build up their house just so they can set torches to it. I've never understood that, but you see that. Where people literally take pleasure in destroying their own house. And you're like, how is it that every decision that you make 
from start to finish is all about destroying your own house and destroying your marriage and destroying your relationship and destroying your children and destroying your finances. Some people want to see the world burn. And that's why the scripture says, marry it, get married to a man of understanding Scriptures tell you, unless, a man, unless this man is holding himself diligently in the fear of the Lord, his house is going to be overthrown. One of the greatest examples of that, of course, is 1 Samuel chapter 25. 1 Samuel 25. A lot of sisters like this history, but for the wrong reason. Some of y'all may be familiar. Abigail and the ball. Starting at verse 1. And Samuel died, and all the Israelites were gathered together and lamented him, and buried him in his house at Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. And there was a man in Maon, whose possessions were in Carmel. And the man was very great, and he had 3,000 sheep and a 1,000 goats, and he was sharing his sheep in Carmel. Now the name of the man was Nabal and the name of his wife, Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. So this woman had good understanding and she was beautiful. But what was the problem? But the man was churlish and evil in his doings and he was of the house of Caleb. So somebody did not give her to a man of understanding. She was given to, she was given to a man that had wealth and substance, but he was not a man of understanding. He was a churlish and evil man. Continue. What does churlish mean? Churlish means rude, disrespectful. I just wanted to make sure because people didn't, you know, you don't hear churlish a lot, but it's like a rude, disrespectful person. Yeah. Like Ash with their mouth. Right. Um, verse four. And David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did share his sheep. And David sent out 10 young men. And David said unto the young men, get up to Carmel and go to Nabal and greet him in my name. And thus shall ye say to him that liveth in prosperity, peace be both to thee and peace be to thine house and peace be unto all that thou hast. Verse seven. And now I have heard that thou hast sharers now thy shepherds which were with us, we hurt them not. Neither was there aught missing unto them all the while they were in Carmel. And thy young men, no, sorry, ask thy young men and they will show thee. Wherefore, let the young men find favor in thine eyes, for we come in a good day. Give I pray thee, whatsoever cometh to thine hand unto thy servants and to thy son David. So how, so how respectful was that? They basically came in the utmost respect. We greet you in the name of David. We, we, we haven't taken anything. The shepherds have lost nothing. We've been helping them. And whatever comes into your hand, can you give something to us to maintain us during the time we're here? Continue. Verse 9. And when David's young men, and when David's young men came, they spake to the ball according to all those words in the name of David and ceased. And Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my sharers and give it unto men whom I know not whence they be? So David's young men turned their way and went again and came and told them all those things. So now think about that. In modern church, they're like, who? Who? Like, who the F is David? Like, I don't know no David. So they just totally discounted everything. He just totally discounted everything that was said and done. And then the whole thing about who is David. Now understand when he says, who, who is David? He's not saying like, I don't know who David is. David was famous. David had already slain Goliath. David was the champion, the champion of war. He led Saul's armies in and out. Songs were sung for him. So don't tell me he didn't know who David was. It wasn't about not knowing David. 
It was about who is David. That's what he was saying. Like, who is he to me? Right. Continue. Verse 13. And David said unto his men, Gird ye on every man his sword. You about to find out who he is. Sorry. Verse, tw- verse 13. And David said unto his men, Gird ye on every man his sword. And they girded on every man his sword. And David also girded on his sword. And there went up after David about 400 men and 200 abode by the stuff. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master, and he railed on them. And he railed on them. Because he's a churlish man. Yeah. But the men were very good unto us, and we were not hurt, neither missed we anything as long as we were conversant with them when we were in the fields. There were a wall, they, they were a wall unto us by night and day. And all the while we were with them keeping the sheep. Verse 17, sorry, I was scrolling. Mm-hmm. Now therefore know and consider what thou wilt do, for evil is determined against our master and against all his household, for he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. So. The thing that always amazed me about that scripture is that who's this talking to Abigail? His servants. So the servants is like, this dude is such a son of Belial, a man cannot even speak to him. So you know that this dude was wicked as hell if the servants are talking to his wife like that. They basically like, yo, you married to him, you know he's a son of Belial. He's a wicked, evil, and base man. Because that's what the son of Belial is. Basically, you saying you're the son of Satan. Verse 18. Huh? Oh, no, I was going on. I'm sorry. So when you look at what they would, but that's what blows my mind every time I read that, is that he's explaining to Abigail, listen, they didn't do nothing wrong. They helped us. And they went to him, and he railed on them. Because when you rail on somebody, that's basically like you just put disrespect when you put talk down to them, you put them at naught. And then he goes on to say, our master is such a son of Belial, a man cannot even speak to him. Continue. Verse 18. Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two bottles of wine and five sheep ready dressed and five measures of parched corn and a hundred clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs and laid them on asses. And she said unto her servants, go on before me, behold, I come after you. But she told not her husband Nabal. Hmm. So it shows you, look at that as a wife of wisdom and knowledge and understanding because she saved, she's, she's working to what? Save his life. Yeah. She could have been like, you know what? This dude is a a-hole, let's let it go down. <laughs> right, right. He is a son of Belial. I'm Belial. part of him too. Notice she didn't dis- disagree with the servants. <laughs> Verse 20. I mean, she didn't say, no, don't say such thing against my Lord or something like that. She was like, yeah, he is. Let me go handle some business real quick and save this fool's life. <laughs> Verse 20. Real. And it was so, as she rode on the ass, that she came down by the covert of the hill, and behold, David and his men came down against her, and she met them. Now David had said, surely in vain have I kept all that all that this fellow hath in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that pertained unto him, and he hath requited me evil for good. Mm. So and more also do God unto the enemies of David, if I leave of all all that pertain to him by the morning, like anything that pisseth against the wall. So David was determined to destroy this man's house and everything there. That's the fury that David had on him for that. Continue. And when Abigail saw David, she hasted and lighted off the ass and fell before David on her face and bowed herself to the ground and fell at his feet and said, Upon me, my Lord, upon me let this iniquity be. And let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience and hear the words of thine handmaid. 
Let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard, regard this man of Bilal. Even <laughs> Hold up, I, I must have totally forgot about that part because I don't even remember her saying that. So read that again. Let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Bilal. So she did agree. She agreed. Keep the ball. But as his name is, so is he. Nabal, Nabal is his name and folly is with him. But I thine handmaid saw not the young men of my Lord whom thou didst send. So because Nabal means literally fool. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, seeing the Lord hath withholden thee from coming to shed blood, and from avenging thyself with thine own hand, now let thine enemies, and they that seek evil to my Lord, be as Nabal. And now this blessing which thine handmaid hath brought unto my Lord, let it even be given unto the young men, young men, that follow my Lord. So she brought him all of those gifts, the food, the figs, all of those things, and gave it to David. And now let's see what happens as far as David's wrath and his anger. I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord, and evil hath not been found in thee all thy days. Yet a man is risen to pursue thee, and to seek thy soul, but the soul of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God, and the souls of thine enemies, them shall he sling out as out of the middle of a sling. So, um, Kabbalah put the point in the chat room that she did that because she was a Proverbs 31 woman, and brought out the point in Proverbs 31, she will do him good, not evil, all the days of his life. So yeah. even when he was, he was in the midst of his wickedness, she still did good for him. Verse 30, and it shall come to pass when the Lord shall have done to my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning thee and shall have appointed thee ruler over Israel, that this shall be no grief unto thee, nor offense of heart unto my Lord, either, either that thou hast shed blood causeless or that my Lord hath avenged himself. But when the Lord shall have dealt with what when the Lord should have dealt well with my Lord, then remember thine handmaid. So now, keep, no, keep in mind, what did Abigail just now say about David? She knew, basically, she knew everything that he was going through, how he's done his works, how he's without sin, and that how he's moving through, not avenging himself and all that. He's doing the work of the Lord, and she knows that the Lord is with him because they haven't found any evil or wickedness within him. And she even went so far as to say that she knew the most I was going to make him king. Yeah. So when wicked Nabal talk about who is David, that's more proof that it was that it was just an insult. It wasn't about him not knowing who David was. What more proof can you have that that was just an insult? Because when you look at Abigail, she ran down a whole history like, and we know that you're going to be king. Ain't that something? Yeah. Continue. Verse 32. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day to meet me. And blessed be thy advice. And blessed be thou which has kept me this day from coming to shed blood and from avenging myself with mine own hand. For in very deed, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, which hath kept me back from hurting thee, except thou hadst hasted and come to meet me, surely. There had not been left unto Nabal by the morning light any that pisseth against the wall. So he basically says, I bless you. I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for your advice. I'm thankful for you for stopping me from sinning. Because if you didn't come to see me, everything you see here would have been destroyed. And there wouldn't have even been a man left to piss against the wall by the time the morning came. Continue. So David received of her hand that which she had brought him and said unto her, go up in peace to thine house. See, I have hearkened to thy voice and have accepted thy person. And Abigail came to Nabal and behold, he held a, a feast in his house. So feast of a king. No, how wicked is that? Here it is. You just rejected everybody that came that did you good. And you came back to home and he's having a feast like a king. 
Continue. And the ball's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunken. Wherefore she told him nothing, less or more until the morning light. Didn't rebuke him at the wine either. Nope. But it came to pass in the morning when the wine was gone out of Nabal, and his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him, and he became as a stone. And it came to pass about 10 days after that the Lord smote Nabal, that he died. So when she told him these things, the fear hit him, his heart died, and he became catatonic, and he died 10 days later. He had a heart attack. Yeah. Scared the living daylights out of him. Literally. Um, verse 20, 39, and when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, blessed be the Lord that hath pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal and have kept this servants from evil. For the Lord hath returned the wickedness of Nabal, of Nabal upon his own head. And David sent and communicate and communed with Abigail to take her to him to wife. So when you look at that, here it is. Okay, let's just finish it, and then um, I'll bring out the formula. Where are we going? All the way to the end? I'm just going to read um, verse 42, down to 42. And when the servants of David were come to Abigail to Carmel, they spake unto her, saying, David sent us unto thee to take thee to him to wife. And she arose and bowed herself to and she arose and bowed herself on her face to the earth and said, Behold, let thine handmaid be a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. Mm. And Abigail hasted and arose and rode upon an ass with five damsels of hers that went after her. And she went after the messengers of David and became his wife. So that's how Abigail became the wife of David. And I am sad to say that this has become almost like a bedtime story for sisters in the faith over the years. It's like when you have sisters in bad marriages, they sit back reading Abigail and, and the ball to themselves like, one day the Lord may kill my wicked husband and give me David. And that shouldn't be that way. And it's sad because when you have scriptures talking about giving being given to a man of understanding or about unless a man hold himself diligently in the fear of the Lord his house shall soon be overthrown and all those things and even with Abigail and the ball when you wonder how this virtuous woman with this great understanding wound up in the care of a man like him a lot of the things go back to what we were dealing with at the beginning the time the time, the counsel, the waiting, the delaying gratification, the, that's what they said in the video, the delaying gratification, but really what Christ was saying, denying yourself and waiting for the most high to reveal what things are supposed to be, what things will be, that's when it all falls into place. So it's sad when you look at sisters in situations where it's basically like, well, I'm not happy. And all I could do is wait for the most I to kill my husband so I could get somebody I want to be with. No. If you're in a situation when you're unhappy, if everybody's still here in the faith and trying to deal right, then do what the scriptures say. Reconcile. Try to deal right. Try to understand where things went wrong and use the time that we still have left to make it work in Christ because we have the power to do that. And so I just want to go to um, just... Two more examples, then we're gonna close out. So another example, two um, examples of what it looks like when it's done the right way. Two good examples of what it looks like to actually wait, to counsel, to delay that gratification, to deny yourself. What does that look like? So we're gonna to go to the book of Tobit. And let me see, I'm not sure what chapter it is. It's Tobit 6. When, um, when he's actually speaking to, when Tobit, to, Tobias is actually speaking to the angel about, about, um, Sarah and about, um, how he's going to meet this, how he's going to meet this woman for the first time. 
so was and once again for the brothers and sisters who are unfamiliar with the book of Tobit, please read it because it will give you a lot of insight into the things that were happening, um, a lot of insight into the things that were happening, even pertaining to marriage. Because in this history that's going on right now, what happened is Tobias is on his way to another city to fetch the money that his father left there. And the person he's traveling with is a man named Azarias. And what he does not, un when what Tobias does not understand is that Azarias is actually an angel. And so um, I think I lost um, Kadar Gadawan. Can you take over for me? I'm here. I'm here. Oh, okay. Just so you think about it. So now we're going to pick up in verse 10. And this is the conversation that he's having with um, with um, Azarias, the angel. So Tobias and Azarias are having a conversation. So pick up at verse 10. And the angel said to the young man, brother, Today we shall lodge with Raguel, who is thy cousin. He also hath one only daughter named Sarah. I will speak for her that she may be given thee for a wife. For to thee doth the right of her appertain, seeing thou only art of her kindred. So when you look at the whole conversation that's going on, now keep in mind that if you read the book of Tobit, it tells you that he was only going there to pick up the package that his father left. So it had nothing, the whole journey that he was going on had absolutely nothing to do with marriage or wife or anything of that nature. That was the furthest thing from his mind when he began this trip. But now, not only, not, not only is he hearing about this, but the angel is basically explaining to him, like, listen, I'm going to speak to the man that, you know, Sarah becomes your wife because this right pertains to you and only you. Continue. And the maid is fair and wise. Now, therefore, hear me, and I will speak to our father. And when we return from rages, we will celebrate the marriage. For I know that Raguel cannot marry her to another according to the law of Moses, but he shall be guilty of death because the right of inheritance doth rather appertain to thee than to any other. So now he's basically telling them like, listen, when we get there, I'm just gonna speak to him and let him know that by right of the, by the law of Moses, you have the right to marry her rather than any other. Because remember there were seven other men that tried to marry her and they all died. Right? Right. So then pick up where we are in verse um, 13. We're at Tobit chapter six, verse 13. Then the young man answered the angel, I have heard brother Azarias that this maid has been given to seven men who all died in the marriage chamber. And now I am the only son of my father and I am afraid, lest if I go in unto her, I die as the other before. For a wicked spirit loveth her which hurteth nobody but those that wish that but those which come unto her. Wherefore I also fear lest I die and bring my father's and mother's life because of me to the grave with sorrow, for they have no other son to bury them. So for, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with the history of Tobit, there was really there was literally a demonic force that was over that place that was killing every single man that came into that marriage chamber and tried to deal with, with um, Sarah. So now, Azarias is gonna to explain to him what he should do, verse 15. Then the angel said unto him, Dost thou not remember the precepts which thy father gave thee, that thou shouldest marry a wife of thine own kindred? Wherefore hear me, O my brother, for she shall be given thee to wife, and thou and, and make thou no reckoning of the evil spirit, but this same night shall she be given thee in marriage. So he said, listen, have you forgotten the precepts of your father, the law? You, she will be your wife. And don't mind, don't take any care or concern about this evil spirit, because by this time, she's gonna be your wife. 16 and 17. And when thou shalt come into the marriage chamber, thou shalt take the ashes of perfume and shalt lay it lay upon them some of the heart and liver of the fish and shall make a smoke with it. And the devil shall smell it and flee away 
and never come again anymore. But when thou shalt come to her, rise up both of you and pray to God, which is merciful, who will have pity on you and save you. Fear so, not. So Azariah showed him exactly what needed to be done to practically exercise that demon out of that chamber so that they could actually go forward in, with the marriage. And he also explained that above all, they had to pray to the Most High for that mercy. And that was what was going to actually sustain their marriage and protect them while, while they were waiting for that evil spirit to be banished from that place. So then he's gonna explain even more in the next verse, continue. Fear not, for she is appointed unto thee from the beginning, and thou shalt preserve her, and she shall go with thee. More so it says, fear, fear not, for she is appointed unto thee from the beginning, and thou shalt preserve her, and shall go with thee, and she shall go with thee. Read. Moreover, I suppose that she shall bear thee children. Now when Tobias had heard these things, he loved her, and his heart was effectually joined to her. So keep in mind, did he know her? Nope. Did he meet her yet? Nope. So the whole deal is it shows you that that whole thing was spiritual because he didn't know her, didn't meet her yet. But when they explained to him that she's a wise, she's a beautiful sister, she's keeping the commandments, she's from this household, and by the right of marriage, she pertains, if the right of marriage pertains to you, and she was pointed to you from the beginning. And all these things, keep in mind, Tobias was not looking for a wife. He didn't travel to the city to find a wife. He went there to handle business for his father. But the Most High opened up the opportunity and showed him that all these things were, were supposed to take place. So why are we going over this? Because it's all about waiting on the Most High. And when you wait on the Most High to reveal it, it's going to be right. But when you try to do things yourself, according to your mind, your wisdom, your limited understanding, you're not going, it's not going to fall into place the way you think it is. And things are not going to end the way you think it's going to end. You might get what you want, but you may not get what you need. You might get the person that you want, but you may not get the marriage that you want. And so that's why it was explained that, listen, this is what it's gonna be. She's gonna give you children. She's gonna love you. And he says from that point on, his heart was effectually joined to her. And that was before they even met or even saw each other. What could tell you, what you got? There's, there's a um, darker part to the scripture that you're bringing out. <laughs> <laughs> and if they ain't the woman for you, you gonna die. <laughs> like them seven men did before. <laughs> they all tried to marry her and they wasn't for her. So what happened when they got in the marriage chamber? They died. That is the darker part, you know. I was focusing more on I was focusing more on the romantic part about how it is or she's for you from the beginning and all that other good stuff and the whole theme of the class about waiting for the most out of the field, you know, look that at, good stuff. Look at this whole role reversal. Right, <laughs> absolutely. In the, in, the last, in the last scripture we're gonna close out on is um, is um, Jacob and Rachel. So, let's see, where's Jacob and Rachel? <laughs> oh my gosh. Because I thought that, that would be a good one to end out on, considering that we went through so much, so many things that we have gone through and have touched on all this, all this heartache and pain and stuff like that. Kadar, Kadar has, he has the right dark theme for his madness. Right. He has the right dog. Crazy thing. guy. <laughs> Genesis 29. And for, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with the agreement, in Genesis 29, it talks about the agreement that Jacob made to work for his uncle Laban for seven years so that he could actually marry the woman that he wanted to marry, which was 
which was uh, Rachel. So we're just going to read 18 to 20 and just go right to the point. Genesis 29, 18 to 20. And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. And Laban said, it is better that I give her to thee than I should give her to another man, abide with me. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had to her. So when you look at that, the scripture says that this man worked for seven years to be with Rachel. And the scriptures tell you that the most, and the most high basically shows us in the scriptures that those seven years were like a few days to him because of the love that he had for Rachel. So that just brings back the same thing that we were talking about this whole class about the time, about the wait, about the delaying the gratification, about denying yourself, and how when you deny self, that's when the blessings come because it's going to be according to what Christ is bringing us and not according to what we're trying to get for ourselves. So it's almost like when you look at the difference between that love and that lust, it's like that lust is running towards something where love can walk. <laughs> the love is a healing thing and lust burns. Love endures, lust breaks. And when you look at lust, it pretty much focuses on the things that you want for yourself, the things you think you need, rather than the things that Christ has prepared for you. Um, lust is more of a focus on your desires, and love focuses more on charity, what's best for the other person. And ultimately, you know, lust is focused on the union of the flesh, where love is focused on a marriage in the sight of the Most High in Christ. And that's the reason why in Ephesians 5 and 12, it explains that that is the great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So that's the quote unquote marshmallow test, the delaying gratification, that if you understand the concept of time, and if you understand that by waiting for the right thing, it's better than rushing for the wrong thing. And so hopefully there's some edification in that. Yeah. Um, you had anything to, anybody got anything to add? Any additions? Kadar, Kakam, Gadai one. And then we'll move to everybody else. Yeah, I just wanted to um, add one scripture that basically goes contrast to um, Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31 talks about who can find the virtuous woman of prices far above rubies. But I always like to bring out the, the opposite in dealing with the man. This is Proverbs 20 and 6. It says, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. And so that goes into the guy with game. That goes into the guy that's counseling for himself. He's going to say how good he is or, you know, how good of a husband he can be. So proclaiming his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. So it's the same thing as far as the the virtuous woman who can find the faithful man, that man that's going to be about the scriptures, that man that's going to be about following the most high in Christ, that man of understanding. A faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. So the faithful man, he's going to be blessed of the most high, and that's the one that sisters should be looking out for. That's it. No praises. Zach, you have something? Okay, I just saw you pop back up. Huh? I'm sorry? What was that? Proverbs, Proverbs 20 and 6. And Proverbs 28 and 20. Anybody else? Questions, comments, concerns? I wanted to ask a question in regards to uh, Jacob. Um, who's to say that it wasn't lust? Because they described Leah as tender-eyed. And of course, Rachel, he was, he was loving her. And did he really know her before? From what I understand, she died because she, she stole an idol from her father. 
You know what's the say it wasn't lost? What? He waited seven years for it. Lust, when we dealing with people with lust, what they jumping right into it. And that was the whole point. There's been other examples of brothers that, that and, and sisters too, that we talked about going through counsel, going through all the right steps, but the brother or sister was going off. But in the, in, in ended up what? Going off and leaving or doing whatever. But in this particular case, what we're looking at is an example of someone that waited, was patient, and waited until the right time to um, work. And then actually for Rachel, he he really ended up working 14 years for her, right? Because it was right. seven years, then he got the, the wrong sister, he got who, Leia? Then he yeah. had to work another seven years. So, you know, Rachel did do her things with the idols and all that, but looking at the way that he dealt, he waited and he dealt according to the scriptures and dealt in patience. Well, Akurai kind of said it. He basically um, was quoting 1 Corinthians 13. So 1 Corinthians 13 says, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not our own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Rejoice is not in iniquity, but rejoice in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hope of all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but wherever there is prophecy, they shall fail. Wherever there be tongues, they shall cease. Wherever there be knowledge, they shall vanish, or vanish away. So you can see this man, he waited, and it wasn't a problem for him. So that's what, that's what I always say love is a great motivator. So he waited all that time and it didn't bust him, right? See, a lot of people, I can't wait, I can't wait, I can't wait. Lust can't wait. Love can endure all things. Love will suffer long. And so he waited for this woman and it wasn't even, it was like, the scripture said it, it was like a few days for him. That's love, that's how, that's what love looks like. It's like, you, you, well, can you wait? It's like the guy who wanna have sex with a woman. It's like, come on, baby, can I, well, what I want to wait. Come on now, why are you being so immature? Like, he didn't do that. He didn't sneak around uh, uh, and, you know, break the agreement. Like, okay, it's five years I waited long enough, I'm going to take it, even though the agreement was seven. It was actually 21 years before he was able to leave his father's house and live on his own. 21 years the man waited. I know, I know what it is, is that um, sometimes it can be difficult for us to see love when we haven't experienced a lot of it. It, it can be difficult. But this is what love looks like. You, you know, you're going you're gonna to have that patience to deal with a lot of things. And I know in my experience, you know, I've, I've seen it, Pam, where people don't have a lot of love. They don't have a lot of patience for you. They're not gonna. They're not gonna be able to help you through thick and thin. So I can understand why you asked that question. Just also wanted just to say really quickly too that um, you know in a in a marriage sometimes like a couple could be married for like twenty years, thirty years, fifteen, you know, forty, whatever, and. It doesn't seem like it's that long. And you look at the person, you're like, oh my goodness, it doesn't even like, here we are celebrating another anniversary. And it does not even seem like it's been that long that we've been married, you know? So I just wanted to mention that as well. Well, sis, um, Janet Jackson made a song about that. She says, funny how time flies when you're having fun. So obviously it was a, <laughs> a pretty good, it's been a pretty good ride. Because uh, when we make bad decisions, life is long. <laughs> a, I know. It's a sandy climb. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. It sounds like the beginning of y'all y'all class. It seems like where y'all were going is like discouraging men from marrying, period. <laughs> but y'all were basically talking about marrying wicked women. So. And the, and the same thing for the sisters, too. Yes. Yes, indeed.
Because I, I know sisters are looking for a faithful man. You're looking for a broke man. <laughs> you're looking for a man that ain't got no job, he ain't got no, you're looking for that faithful man. Same as the brother's looking for a virtuous woman. You're looking for that. Men, brother's looking for Sarah and sister's looking for Abraham. But you gotta be Abraham to get Sarah and you gotta be Sarah to get Abraham. All right, so if we don't have anything else, I'll send up the Lord's Prayer. And we'll continue talking. Matthew 6 and 9 through 13. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. In the name of Christ, we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, in the name of Christ, we ask that you continue to watch over, guide, bless, and protect us with your knowledge and wisdom and understanding of the scriptures, that you guide us in the example of your son Christ, that we may walk closer and closer to his image day by day. May the words that we learn today in all the Sabbath classes and as we learn throughout the weeks, months, and years, be guides to bless us, strengthen us, grant us more wisdom, help us to change, help us to be better examples, help us to lead. We ask that you watch over those that are pregnant, those that are traveling, those that are ill. We ask that you have mercy on the many people, the many family members, co-workers, brothers, sisters, and the truth that are going through hard times, that you look over them, let us be examples to them, let us be those comforts, allow us to help them, and allow them to have peace and understanding in their time of tribulation. We thank the Heavenly Father for all our mercy. In the name of Christ, we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. And I hope everyone understand that, that that class wasn't just talking about marriages going into any any lust. Not having time, not waiting. 